Thank you, Fred. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to thank Dr. Dickerson for some time for us. Maybe we will start with the trainees who are the PhD trainees who are doing some implementation studies to tell us the few who can take us through some of the studies. Okay, their studies are the IMS methods that are involved in their studies. Maybe from that we can, we can pick up from that and we can just yeah, answer some of the questions that we have. I'm proposing that we begin with the trainees who have some good implementation science studies, for example, Joan, Martin. They can share with us what they have the implementation science components in their studies. Maybe ask a few questions and if they can help us answer. And we can have a round of introductions so that um, at least we know who is. Yes, that would be helpful. <coughs> I'm Rhonda Nambiru, project administrator for the HIV implementation science program. Yeah, okay, the first thing we'll do is science. That's awesome. Sorry. I'm Samson Morgan. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Matt Mbutu. I work with Margaret University during this program. I support clinical activities. I have been uh, one of the trainees for the online course. Just completed. Dr. Well Nulex and gentlemen, I must ask this to explain the first year. I'm a professor at the University of California, San Francisco. Um, it's nice to meet some of you for the first time, see some of you again, and put names to faces for those of you who have been in the uh, online program. Um, so uh, I don't have anything prepared today. Um, I'm happy to talk about a particular topic if, if that's helpful, but mainly I think the goal, um, as Fred and Rhoda indicated to me, was to be available to answer some of the questions that you're struggling with as you're thinking about what your project is or doing your projects um, as it relates to implementation science and helping everyone to sort of talk through some of those questions um, that you might be sort of facing or struggling with uh, you know, in your own work. Um, if there are questions and there are specific topics that you want to hear about, we can <coughs> kind of do some sort of impromptu kind of talk, but I think you know, uh, you guys can listen to talks anytime. Uh, the advantage of having, you know, someone, um, an expert in the room is that you can have a conversation with them. So please don't be shy. Um, some of the questions that you might have, I'm sure other people are struggling with as well. Um, and so, or some people might hear for the first time. Uh, so, you know, this is really a chance for you all to uh, uh, talk with someone um, and, you know, 
uh, hopefully get some answers to some of the things that you're, uh, you're struggling with. So maybe I'll just stop there um, and we can start. Good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, my name once again is Martin Mungu. So I completed my online course in June. And the area that I'm um, working on is um, integrating management of non communicable diseases in the Shining And in particular, we are doing a study that is integrating hypertension care within uh, the Mulago ISIS clinic. This is the largest HIV clinic in Uganda. Just uh, for distance from here. So, first of all, I want to appreciate Aditya for the for wonderful learning that we went through for the last one year. The course that I enjoyed most was the one on study science, so which I think we connected. We learned a lot from that. So, during the training, my, my project was mainly a focus on screening for hypertension within the HIV. And I propose to do this in Toro District because I've done some prior work in Toro. I used to work in Eastern Uganda. But then, during the course of the training, this implementation science training, I, working with Fred and uh, other colleagues, we applied for a grant. Uh, still, in that application, we utilized some of the knowledge from the implementation science course. And uh, we successfully uh, got awarded uh, a clear grant to integrate hypertension care, both screening and treatment, into the nervous system. So, because my initial plan was to do the study tomorrow, this project had to start almost immediately. So, I ended up uh, now focusing on this that we have been <coughs> funded for, and then I took it up as my information science project and the PI and then Fred is a fourth PI and two other colleagues, Lisa and Jeremy Wizard here. So in this particular project at ISS clinic, we have five objectives and one of the objectives was, was first of all uh, to map the care cascade for hypertension within the HIV clinic. Because that is now helping us to understand the critical care gaps that are unable to, to our targeted interventions. Uh, we really did that and we realized that uh, many of our patients are screened, actually all of them. But the major gaps have been mainly access to medicine and treatment. And that also impacted on hypertension control, which has been at 27%. So our critical area of intervention is now to make sure that people are treated and we put the control. Then the second objective is to, to, to aim to, to understand the perspectives and preferences and, and perceptions of the healthcare providers and the patients as regards uh, the integration of screening and treatment of hypertension in the HIV clinic. Because as we do the integration, we don't want to, to undo the gains the HIV program has received. In that clinic, viral control is up to 97%. So we want to be able to integrate hypertension care and also continue to sustain the good fiber suppression, HIV control that is in that clinic. So we wanted to understand perception and, and perspectives from both providers and patients. We already did that and we are already analyzing some of the data and that is feeding into the intervention that we are now going to, 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 to actually implement. So the intervention that we are going to implement uh, which is the our third objective is based is, is, um, is based on the WHO hearts uh, technical package for cardiovascular control. And there are about five components in that package. One of them is health lifestyle counseling, uh, access to medicines, uh, improving systems for monitoring for NCDs, uh, team based care, and then. Uh, yeah, they're about five. So, so, and our qualitative work also tried to engage providers and patients to understand their uh, perspectives as regards to this proposed intervention. And we think that the information we got from the patients and providers is going to help us to refine that five component 
intervention to be able to uh, intervene and improve our treatment and control. Now, the, the other is to now measure the effectiveness of this intervention that we are designing. And that made our fourth objective, which, which is to, uh, to determine the effectiveness of this stakeholder informed uh, WHO based intervention. Maybe to mention, in our qualitative inquiry, we use the behavior change wheel uh, in our qualitative work. So, and the, the, the methods that we're using for determining the effectiveness is the controlled interrupted time series. So we chose the controlled interrupted time series because we, we are implementing this intervention in a clinic, in a real world setting. Uh, we're not, it's not a clinical trial, so we are giving people medicine, we are training and we are So we have the ISS clinic as the intervention site, and we have a Health Center, which is also a very large clinic as the control site. In the interrupted time series, we are collecting data one year before our intervention is starting and one year after the start of the intervention. And the outcome of interest is hibernation control. So we are determining control monthly for one year before and then one year after. But we do that, the data points are actually one month apart. And we think that having a control site and an intervention site is helping us to, uh, to improve the reliability to control for seasonality and competing interventions. So the sites we chose are very similar. ISS clinic is the largest with about 16,000 patients. Single Health Center 4 ha has 11,000 patients. They are both located in Kampala. They implement the same guidance from the Minister of Health and they are supported by IDI through MGM as, as, as the implementing partner. So we think that the variations are very minimal between those two sites. The major difference is the intervention that we are doing at the ISS clinic, which is not happening at the at Center Center. And then after the implementation period of one year, we want to do an evaluation uh, to, to evaluate the implementation of this intervention. And we, we, with that, we we'll aim to use the AIM framework. And maybe the question I want to pose to you and maybe to the colleagues is whether we want also to, do, to determine the cost of this intervention that we are uh, proposing and implementing. So, can we still use the AIM to, 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 to determine the cost, effectiveness, and the cost uh, of our intervention? So I don't know if I've communicated, but that is basically what we are, we are doing. And uh, I'm happy to have additional guidance and questions regarding this, this work. That's great. Um, so thank you for that. So first, I just want to say um, uh, your implementation science training is clearly showing in your description. So uh, congratulations. There are many. <coughs> trainees that we are working with or people that we are uh, holding these kind of seminars for and some of the things that you've said, interrupted time series, controlled interrupted time series, re people, many people who don't even know these things. Right? So uh, I think you're well ahead of the game uh, for you know, starting to understand some important sort of concepts and ideas in implementation science. So. Uh, I guess we should also congratulate the training program that it's a success and uh -huh. has transferred this, uh, this knowledge, so it's great to hear and see. Um, so maybe uh, I'll just make some generic comments uh, uh, as a way to start the discussion for others. Um, so, you know, uh, there's a lot of interesting sort of things about your, uh, sort of your, your comments and your study. I mean, so one is um, that you've sort of uh, said you went through this combi or, I guess, process to identify qualitative products and such. Um, you also said that you chose this sort of uh, WHO intervention. And so one of the things to think about for everybody is then, um, if you were already going to choose that intervention, why go through that process? Or how did that process inform uh, the, how you adapted or delivered or tailored? So what did you use the qualitative work for? if you already had a package of intervention. So that's just something for you to think about in general. Second sort of just discussion point, um, 
I would raise is uh, you mentioned sort of a, um, a controlled interrupted time series uh, design. Um, and so I uh, just want to make sure everyone understands what that is. Uh, and the question that I pose for some of the others is, why do you think he chose that design as opposed to maybe just a, a pre-post design or a controlled pre-post design? What are some of the advantages and disadvantages to make sure we all sort of understand that? Um, last, um, you asked about the REAIM framework. And so, uh, and specifically whether um, it can be used to measure cost and cost effectiveness. So um, what I think a general point of discussion for to make sure everyone understands is sort of what is the REAIM framework? What are the types of measures that one should consider under each of those domains? Reach, effectiveness, um, uh, adoption, implementation, and uh, maintenance. And do people think costs or cost effectiveness fit under those domains? So those are the general comments. People can uh, start tackling any of those questions or other ones. But, um, and then you know, I can help guide the discussion. We can also go through them one by one. So what do you guys think about uh, the qualitative assessment that you did? Uh, and how do you think um, he either should have or did use it uh, in terms of either identifying or, or specifying his implementation strategy? So maybe just to, 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 to say something before other members coming, that very hard question. So the HUD's technical package has six components. I wanted to be sure that all the components are relevant uh, to our setting, because this is a WHO guideline, uh, which has to be applied across very many countries. But even with guidelines, I think our countries see through what the WHO brings, right. and then they adopt them to the setting where they are. And with our qualitative inquiry, uh, inquiry, we realized that one of the components, the A stands for health lifestyle counseling, which is very relevant to our people, and people appreciated that we need that. The evidence-based treatment protocols are also very important, because as we give people medicines, we have to use the, the most relevant uh, components of treatment that are effective to our population. The A uh, stands for access to medicine, and that is the biggest problem that we've been battling with. So if run, the patients and providers came out and said, yes, we need the medicine, the risk-based charts, these are a bit complicated. You want to assess whether someone who has hypertension, do they have diabetes, do they have history of stroke, do they have a previous heart attack, then you the treatment also has to be different from the usual, and we don't have some of the medicines for those kind of patients. So, so that did come up very clear as one of the priorities in our project. So for such patients who may seem to have other comorbidities, we refer them to the Heart Institute and other centers. So that helped us to understand from the providers and the patients that this is not one of the core things that we want to go for. Uh, the T uh, standing for, uh, I forget the T and the S, but we find that five of, the, five of the six companies were very relevant to our setting and we are actually implementing them, but we left out one. So we thought that we needed to adopt uh, the, the guideline to our setting, but other, other members can also uh, give some comments. Yeah, so I guess my question for others then is, so you mentioned uh, healthy lifestyle counseling was one of them. Right? So um, how might the, the qualitative work inform the delivery of that intervention? Yeah, first of all, I'd like to thank you for taking here. I'm one of the beneficiaries of the online implementation science training and I think it's a very so in response to, to, to your question, I found the, the combi model very rich in guiding hypothesis for or a plan for an intervention. 
For example, you're talking about lifestyle. Lifestyle, for example, that company model has um, opportunity. It has a component so for physical and psychological capability, and then automatically and um, social opportunity, then automatic and um, your physical and social opportunity, and then automatic and reflective motivation. So maybe through that model, as you do the qualitative work, maybe you can find that some of the maybe people you interview do not have the social support to be able to have um, healthy living. And then as you plan your intervention, you can plan towards a package that is rich in social support. Maybe you can find that they actually do not have the physical opportunity. They are poor. They are poor and they are not informed. They have a low, I mean, they don't have the physical opportunity for healthy living and because of the circumstances around them. And maybe you can work with them. That's why in the, um, implementation science is rich in some multidisciplinary team. Then you can tailor an intervention that brings in other bodies that can support these people in those areas to be able to have healthy living. So as a response to that, I can say that each of these components <coughs> were utilized during the qualitative uh, interviews can be very rich in guiding an intervention that's specifically targeted to helping the people we are trying to actually help. Yeah, I think that's a nice summary, right? I mean, you say something like healthy lifestyle counseling. Um, there may or may not even be guidelines of what that means, but the question is sort of how do you actually deliver it in this context so it addresses the key issues that one needs to cover, right? So what are the knowledge barriers that people have here related to hypertension? What are the beliefs that might motivate them to take medicines or not? Do they, uh, who do they uh, listen to, right? Who should deliver that counseling? Should it be a health worker? Should it be a peer? Um, yesterday I found out they believe things the peers say much more than the health workers say, right? And so these are all the, um, the types, in fact, you know, just hearing that is useful for the study that we're doing in the ISS clinic that, you know, we need to involve the peers in some of the counseling we're doing around TB preventive therapy, um, perhaps. So the point, the general point being, um, it's really important to adapt interventions to their, to your context, right? And so counseling in one setting might not be the same. You have to figure out what are the important messages to deliver them, how are you going to deliver them, who, um, in what format. Um, is it going to be standard counseling that everybody gets in the while they're in the waiting area or one-on-one -on -one counseling? Um, is that feasible to deliver in routine care, not just part of your research study, so for the health system side? So these are the reasons why sort of doing that kind of qualitative assessment um, you know, guided by a model like Combi or, or others is useful to really understand exactly what you will deliver and how you will deliver it. And that's true for every component of this, you know, WHO sort of framework, right? I mean, team-based care, what does that mean in this context? Right? How is that going to be delivered? Who's going to be involved, right? Um, is that acceptable to sort of patients and providers? And so those are the details that you're trying to gather um, as part of the assessment. Okay, is that is that clear? Mm -hmm. Folks? Um, and it's, at the same time, you're also trying to then, that also informs your evaluation, and I think that's the piece that other people forget, so, or people often forget. So, in the end, you've decided to, on a particular intervention or way of delivering it because you think it's targeting certain barriers. Right? So, you mentioned, um, for example, that you want to know whether it improves hypertension control. But what I want to know first is does it actually modify those barriers? one of your barriers was knowledge after the counseling does patients' knowledge and awareness improve? If one of the barriers was um, their motivation or their belief that hypertension is important, does that actually improve after your counseling? If it doesn't, right, then why even bother looking at the outcomes? You haven't yet achieved what you wanted to achieve. If it does work, right, let's just say that um, you, uh, you ended up improving hypertension control, right? If you don't know whether or not you modify the barriers, then you have no idea why your intervention worked. If 
If you tried it again, it may or may not work. If you tried it in a different setting, it may or may not work. So part of doing the qualitative assessment and making sort of and, and picking your targets is also then informing your evaluate what measures should you evaluate. Right? It's very important to understand not just whether your intervention worked in, in improving <coughs> your behavior, like in this case hypertension adherence or, or management, but also um, you know did the barriers that you were targeting actually change? Right? That's the science. So implementation is I do something, does it work? Right? The science is understanding why it worked or didn't work, or how it worked or didn't work. And you guys are scientists, not just implementers. Yeah, and I think, sorry, in one of the studies they provided these medicines, and I think they were called drugs that you, I mean, a decimal fraction. So I think that brings out the energy one of those small things that has the behavior change and what behaviors are key that must be targeted and how we evaluate whether they have changed or not. So in this case, just like we thought of not anti-hypertensive medications, but even more we are providing the control did not go up as expected. So um, I think there is a participant yeah, and so when I see um, evaluate grant proposals, um, again, many people just want to go right to the end and measure if something worked. But really, uh, you know, what I want to see first is, you know, is it working as you thought it should work? Is it doing the things that you think it should be doing? And that's the, the initial data one needs to collect to support a larger evaluation. And if one hasn't done that or proposed to do that as part of the evaluation, um, and then someone's propos proposing a large evaluation, you know, we automatically, you know, like for me, I sort of criticize it. But in your case, I mean, you're doing an initial pilot, you know, an interrupted time series. But as part of that, you know, you really want to sort of understand whether the interventions you're doing are actually targeting and modifying and overcoming the barriers that you intended should be overcome. Um, so that's. Okay, I hope that's part of the I think the next um, point that I raised, and again, we can uh, remember the point here is not to discuss my questions. I'm trying to bring up questions because I know you guys are shy. Uh, but the next thing I want to make people sure people understand is sort of, um, let me just add, why, why do you think he chose an interrupted time series? And even before that, what is an, what is an interrupted time series? Somebody else has to answer. Someone else? Yes. I hope you know what an interrupted time series is since you're proposing it. <laughs> <laughs> So let's first let's start with what it is. What is an interrupted time series? I think there is a seasonal effect that Controlled hypertension, right? 
So uh, data at multiple time points before the intervention, then the intervention takes place, and then more data is collected at multiple time points after the intervention. But because your intervention is about control hypertension, that takes us, because if someone has an IBP and uh, <laughs> and then I think that outcome can be measured in quite a short time. Fairly, fairly. fairly, and you can be able to pick the time. So, I, I, to me, I think that is why Martin chose an interrupted time series. And he chose a control because he wanted to improve the internal validity of his study by having a comparison group. Thank you very much. Uh, to add to what uh, Susan has said, the interrupted time uh, series also brings in an advantage of helping you to be able to look at trends of whatever you're, you're studying. So it's a before and after, but a modified one that is going to help you to be able to assess uh, trends over time. Perfect. Okay, so I think just to make that more, that was very well said for both of you. Um, so just to make it more concrete, so let's say you're doing a pre-post study and you found that the average in the pre-period was, um, make sure I have to do my math correctly, was, uh, uh, was 25%. And then the average in the uh, post-period was um, 50%, right? So if you do a pre-post design, you say you improved from you know, 35% to uh, 50%. Okay, or 30% to 50%, right? Um, but let's just say that then um, you actually analyzed as an interrupted time series. So meaning that you, instead of just saying what was the average in the pre-period, 30%, and what was the average in the post-period, 50%, you decided to analyze the data by saying, okay, in the, the pre-period, I'll divide it into monthly time points. In the post-period, I'll divide it into monthly time points. In the pre-period, the monthly measures were 20, 30, and 40. And then in the post period, it was 40, 50, and 60. So if I tell you that, do you think there was a significant change? Why or why not? I think there was a significant change. No, when it comes to different forms, this was an improvement over, over time. Sorry, it was or was not? There was uh, an improvement if you're doing the pre and post. Though, when it comes to the different time points, this wasn't improving over time. It is improving over time. Yeah. It improved from 20 to 30 to 40 to 40 to 50 to 60. But the question is, was that improvement a result of your intervention? So go ahead. Well, because I was going to say that, uh, because sometimes it's really, you might not be sure or certain that the improvement is actually due to your intervention. Because if it was a downward trend, maybe it was possible that that trend would have continued with that intervention. Which now, the extra data points that you have due to the uh, interrupted time series, you can actually be able to uh, roll that out and be able to really show that this improvement would not have happened without the intervention. Okay, and in the, in the numbers or case that I showed you, do you think there was a uh, change in the trend? Yeah. In the trend? Mm -hmm. Same trend, right? Same trend, right? Same trend. 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 Same the Same trend. 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 Right. So how can you say that there was actual improvement because the same trend of improvement was occurring? And unless you analyze that as an interrupted time series, you would think that there was an improvement in the post-period relative to the pre-period. Mm -hmm. The strength of the interrupted time series design is to say, well, you know, it's not just one time point, it's to say what was happening to your outcome beforehand, right? Was it staying the same? Was it improving? And then after you intervene, is there some sort of change either in the level, so all of a sudden it jumps up, or does the rate of change increase? 
improve, assuming you want to improve the outcome. And so it's a stronger design because it takes into account, yes, you said seasonal trends, but um, you know, it's important to understand why, right? That's sort of the reason that, so what does seasonal trends mean? These are the seasonal trend means, is there already an underlying trend in the outcome? And are you actually changing that trend? And then, as you mentioned, someone else mentioned, the control nature makes you think, make, it, it doesn't really help you account for seasonal trend, but what it allows you to account for is, let's just say something unrelated happened. All of a sudden, the ministry funded 20 more health workers per health center, or you know, did something, right? So what you want to know then is if you have another, if you didn't have a control health center, you may have seen an increase post-intervention in your health center, but that health, that intervention, that increase might have been due to something other than your intervention. Mm -hmm. By showing that there was actually no change somewhere else, hopefully somewhere else that's similar, then any change that you'd see in your health center is more likely due to the intervention. Okay, so a controlled analysis is always uh, lends more credibility, right, more plausibility that the effect that you're seeing can be ascribed to your intervention in any non-randomized design, right, such as an interrupted time series. Same is true with a pre-post. Right? Doing a controlled pre-post where you have some control group that you choose and showing there's no change in pre-post <coughs> is better than just doing a pre-post. Okay, so what that means for you is that if you have a choice, if you're working at four health clinics, it's always better to reserve two of them as controls, or at least one, right, if you can. Right? Um, rather than sort of intervene in all of the sites in order to sort of have, um, to be able to sort of say that, you know, what happened was not a result of other things changing um, that were not a result of your intervention. I think actually I have an experience to share. Let me say, in my, um, I was sharing an experience just like Martina shared. Uh, I'm, I'm one of the trainees and I went through the online course. It uh, helped me while I was coming up with that concept for my doctor studies. So I'm looking at uh, HIV self-testing and how it can help improve HIV testing rates and linkage relation. So in the beginning, I conducted qualitative studies to first understand why men are not testing and uh, what exactly it can help them to test. And I use constructs of the home being to come up to, you know, to create questions and understand what is it exactly that's bothering me. So after uh, conducting the qualitative studies, I realized most men were bothered by moving to um, far places to test. Uh, since I had a preconceived uh, intervention of uh, self-testing, because there was existing evidence that it can actually help uh, testing go up for hard to reach populations among which men were listed, I, uh, I decided to, to use some of the information I got uh, of hygiene to go to far distances and then uh, 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 um, appreciating support of peers and community health workers to uh, add a small component to my work and uh, have self-test kits delivered by community health workers to the men, but only at their homes. So in my work, I used a pre and post design and like, I collected information at the first line. But right now, as a video sharing, I realized, oh, okay, maybe if I had had control for the that I left out, I would have uh, observed something much better. I'm still uh, the preliminaries of analyzing, but um, when I sent, went out to the communities and gave out kids, the community of workers gave out kids, at the start we had about 82% 80, of all men had tested, lifetime testing, and uh, about 19% of them had never tested in life. So at the end of the intervention, I'm, I'm uh, looking at my data and I'm realizing a 13 percent change, which right now I'm questioning: is it really, um, is it really because of the intervention, or there could have been something else? One of the things I know is that while I was doing this work, is before the ministry pilots of the self testing happened in community. But I think this is something the rest of us have to take into account as you're doing work because fields keep evolving, and it's uh, something that we have to take. <coughs> and I wanted to make a comment from which Martin did bring out how we selected the site, how we ended up at the same. Maybe you want to throw some light on that. The, the, the dynamics are like that. 
Yeah, so we selected Chisoni is called Zelda 3 because I think from the learning, we, we can't have a perfect control site. But we need a site which is as close, which is similar as possible to that site where the intervention is going to take place. For example, these clinics are, are the largest in Japan. And most, most likely also in Japan, they are both um, supported through the IDI program, they are implementing the same guidelines. They are not very distant from each other because if we select a site in Soroti and one in Kampala, that that's a lot and create a lot of uh, difference, but they are very close to each other. So we had another option, we had another option of a smaller site which is supported by Makari uh, University Journalist Program. But then we realized that some of the health workers in the, in the ISIS clinic go and support this site. And we are, we are training these health workers in the ISIS clinic. And most likely, when they go to the other site, they are going to start changing things. They are going to, to direct it through the medicines when it's not available. They are going to describe. So we said no, there must be, there's, there's related to be contamination and uh, and uh, unreliability of the disaster. So we chose the same way uh, the ISIS clinic doesn't have any connection in terms of human resource support. Uh, because there we know what is going to happen there is entirely going to be uh, due to the underlying factors and what is going to happen in uh, ISIS is likely to, to be due to the intervention that we are proposing. So those dynamics are there, but I think we managed to discuss them and came to, to choose that one. Yeah, I mean, I think thinking about contamination is always important in any real world research, right? Um, uh, but then it's also important, you do your best to choose a control tool, but it's never, I can't guarantee that it's exactly the same. In fact, when I was at Chisenia yesterday and I was at the Longo ISS yesterday, <laughs> and I can tell you they're very different. <laughs> right? yeah, sure. They're not. The environments in the two are, are very different. But that's okay, right? it's not a randomized design. You do the best you can to pick a control that is reasonable. Right? It's, you can never say that, uh, you, know, you state the reasons you chose it, but it can never be the perfect control. So I think you were gonna say something. Yes, thank you so much. Um, question. I have a question about the about have to decide. Um, so I'll give you some examples. I mean, we're doing this stepped wedge trial of a digital health intervention called 99Docs, 
in health centers in Uganda, and we said, you know what, we're going to train the health centers. So a step wedge trial means that at each time period, um, you know, an in intervention switches from routine care to the intervention. So um, at, at when that switch happens, then you have to train that new health center for the intervention. And so we said, you know, it, we think that it will take at least one month for them to get adjusted to this new way of monitoring TB treatment and using this. So we're going to specify in our protocol that the first month is what we call a um, kind of uh, uh, an intervention period, and we're going to exclude data during that period. So patients who are enrolled on treatment during that period, they don't count as either the control period or the intervention period. You can do the same thing in an interrupted time series, right? That you are going to uh, not, you're not going to start collecting data until the month after the intervention is introduced right? for it to take time. That said, I mean, and you can even do a longer period. You can say you're going to wait until six months after it's introduced, right? But then it gets, the longer it gets, takes, you have to really think about are there changes occurring during that time and are you going to include those in the control period or not? So in general, an interrupted time series is, and a step away are really better for interventions that you expect to have an impact um, in a relatively sort of short time period. Um, for your second question around sort of um, acceptability, this is also a challenging one. I mean, I think the important lesson as researchers is that you have to sort of work with your stakeholders, right? Why do you have inclusion criteria? If, if your intervention is appropriate for a certain target population and you're doing implementation research and in the real world, that entire population would be the target of your intervention. Why are you limiting it to only some people? What's the rationale behind that? Is there a reason to do that? Um, my, my focus has been in prevention of mother chain transmission of HIV. And so my original focus was only in uh, mother chain transmission of HIV. But then the, it's the enhancing intervention. And um, the question is it will benefit in the other people. So at the facility level, they're asking can we have the same guide to actually prevent cancer to other participants? So why can't I mean why can't they why can't you just study the impact of one group? Well, I'm, for you, I mean, why why does it? How do you feel it impacts your ability to study that group if they're counseling other people? Well, um, one is that because I'm a student, and I I I I am not time in terms of this would require the next level of amendment. So it's something I'm thinking about. It doesn't require any amendment. You're not doing. You're saying they can do whatever they want. Oh, so in other words, you're trying to say that I can still do what I'm doing, but I'm letting the others without. That's their clinical decision. Right? I mean, you can't. They like what they're doing, and they want to do it. As long as you're not collecting data on that other population, mm -hmm. um, there's no IRB issue. <laughs> yeah, I mean, again, if, if, if yeah, the facility is more. I think it's. But right. you have control states. Yeah, I have control states. Yeah, so we just focus on the target population. Do you focus your data collection and analysis on the target population and allow them to use the tool however they want to use it? Yeah. <laughs> In that case, let it be. Let me I mean, hopefully you've done the qualitative component beforehand to show that it's highly desired and acceptable, right, before you roll it out. Right? And then once you roll it out, what you're more interested in is, is it being delivered the way you intended? Only have to 
to be a randomized controlled study, a trial, or something that is coming out of a well-designed um, research setting, can't it be, I go to this place, I get this best practice, it is showing that uh, viral load improvement, and there's been viral load improvement after implementing this particular intervention, but they did go through IRB to that kind of a rigorous uh, study setting. You know, I'm curious to hear what others think, but ultimately, uh, what what can be scaled up is whatever decision makers are willing to scale up. <laughs> <laughs> and so, in general, I hope decision makers want to scale up things that have stronger evidence, but there's sometimes things that don't have great evidence or there's good local evidence that makes sense to scale up. There are many things that we do based on expert opinions. So, an example in tuberculosis, we do directly observed therapy. There's been no trial ever showing that DOT is helpful. In fact, every trial shows that it's not helpful. <laughs> Yet that brings the standard of care and what people are trying to scale up. Um, there. So, I mean, in the end, I, mean, I think what we say for implementation, I mean, the, when you, when there, the more evidence there is, Oftentimes, the easier it is to convince people that something is, can be scaled up or should be scaled up. As a program, if you make a decision to scale something up and there's not evidence behind it, you know, you may take it to Bobago ISS and Fred will say, why are you telling me to do this? <laughs> so you have to convince him in some way <laughs> that what you're doing, if it's not based on evidence, it's something else that will convince him to do it, right? And it might be that oftentimes decision making, I mean, so you have your level of decision making and then you have the frontline decision makers. And the frontline decision makers will say, okay, the ministry wants me to do this, so I must do it, but I'm not going to give it as much attention to something else that I believe is going to sit, I know from other evidence. Other people might, you know, may not have the training like Fred and say, we don't know about randomized trials and all these things. If the ministry tells me to do something, I'm going to do it. Right? So a lot of what should be scaled up is really um, you know, based on what decision makers think something should be scaled up. Now, if I were a funder and a program is coming to me to ask me to fund something for scale up, you know, I'd want to have, I, mean, I have all my priorities, right? I have to give my funding to all of these different things. Most funders will prioritize things that there's good evidence to support because so many evidence-based things are not being scaled up already. But again, in the end, it's all up to the decision maker um, and then the frontline you know, implementers to decide whether to scale something or not. And one of the things that's considered is evidence, but that's not the only thing that people consider, as, as you probably well know from, from being in the program, about whether or not to scale up something. Does that help? I mean, I don't know what others think. I mean, I don't know. I think we should switch for you to talk to this group about what are the kind of opportunities um, in terms of implementation research that people can start thinking about. In terms of funding? Yeah. Um, I feel like that's a question you can, you can better answer than me here. I mean, I can talk you know, about. You are not Fogarty, you are not NIH, but I'm sure there are some small um, things that maybe sometimes you can really think about. You know, I mean, I think there are some smaller things, you know, the, um, there are various fellowships, uh, Global Health Equity Scholars Fellowships, um, there's uh, the, what is the one, GloCal is one that all of the University of California has had. Um, many of, much of, a lot of, they don't only fund implementation science, but I mean, I think they all recognize that implementation science is something that's important for global health, and those are opportunities to have you know, projects funded. Um, many of the CFARs, not just at UCSF, but across the country, have mentored scientist awards. Um, and those are, you know, good pots of money for people to uh, to go after. Um, I don't know the European funding as well, but um, there's certainly a lot more funding available through EDTCP and others and fellowships and also for small grants than there are through uh, U.S. institutions. Aside from those, though, I mean, I think, you know, I was just at a national court <coughs> meeting for the TV program. And one of the things that's interesting is that, you know, they, 
they have an operational research budget. Um, one of the things they actually mentioned today was that they, ha they haven't spent it and it might go away. Right? So they were asking for operational research proposals. And so I think it's true in general that there's you know, many programs um, have some budget for operational research or have some implementing partner who is, uh, has a budget for op operational research, right? And so you know, some of this then is sort of f figuring out what their priorities for research are and how your interests can fit into those. And that's a way of you know, getting funding for work that you don't necessarily even have to apply for. Um, an example is, again, they were talking today about there's very high rates of TB in Karamoja and they don't know why, and the TB control cascade is really poor there. Um, and so they wanted to support operational research to understand sort of what's going on and where interventions can be done there. Right? You guys should look for those opportunities, right? You guys are trained. You have training in implementation research much beyond the typical operational research that's done and they do some quick surveys and find what's going on. Right? And I think people will understand the value of that um, given your training and your ability to talk about sort of high quality designs to actually sort of understand what's going on, do mixed methods analyses and such. So working with the programs, the main implementing partners, um, uh, you know, to really understand sort of what money is available, right, is another sort of thing. Um, I don't know in HIV, maybe there's there's more, you know, the, 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 there's probably more attention to implementation research and the partners are already gobbling up the money, but um, still, I mean, I think it's worth sort of looking around and asking for. But I, I don't know that those are, I don't know if you have other suggestions. <coughs> Thank you all.